Andalusia, and welcome to another wild episode of me. <laughs> Today's episode is because I love trains, and this is a very special episode. It's been 50 years in the making, and when I say 50 years, I literally mean 50 years, and I will explain. But come with me as I try to chase down, photograph, and stay out of everybody's way as I'm watching the world's largest locomotive with the Union Pacific that's running under steam go through Nevada into California and then back from California through Nevada. The story begins in the early 1960s when the Union Pacific finally retired its largest steam locomotives, the 4000 series, to parks and fairgrounds with the 4014 going to Pomona, California, where it was enjoyed by many kids, including me. Whereas a child, I was hoping that maybe someday it would run. But of course, seven-year-old me, I'd like to see it run. Well, in about 2012, the Union Pacific decided they were going to try and restore this locomotive for actual operation. So, with a lot of work and dedication, they moved it from Pomona to Cheyenne, Wyoming. It be rebuilt and converted from burning coal to oil, run for special occasion operations for the employees and for the rail fans. I heard that the Union Pacific was going to run this thing through Reno. You bet I gassed up my car and decided to go and see this bad boy running through the countryside. Which, of course, is what I did. Fueling up my Suburban, I was off to the races. To a small town in California called Portola, which is 30 minutes away from Reno. Portola is one of those small little towns that actually owes its existence to the railroad. But at the time, it would have been known as the Western Pacific, which was never a subsidiary, but in 1983 was purchased and absorbed by the Union Pacific. Riding in plenty of time to see this bad boy coming through Portola and actually stopping there for a couple of days before going to Sacramento, of course, I'm going to grab something to eat, which was breakfast. And considering this was a special occasion, I decided, I think I'm going to go ahead and get waffles. Now, the only cafe open had, of course, waffles and some sort of sausage. But this is California, and I found out later it was vegan sausage. But I didn't know it was vegan sausage at the time. So, of course, I'm going to sit here and enjoy my waffle. And I tell you, I don't know what it is about restaurants, but they really make some massive waffles. Well, the waffle's pretty good, especially since I drowned it in syrup and butter. But then again, that's how we Americans eat. Waffles, with lots of syrup and butter. Even those little toaster waffles. Then I decided to try the sausage, which didn't even look like sausage. Kind of tasted like sausage, but I don't know. There was something about the sausage I didn't like. After breakfast, I decided to go visit the Western Pacific Museum or the Feather River Rail Museum which also happened to house one of the largest diesel locomotives that the Union Pacific had built. Now, this museum is dedicated, obviously, to the Western Pacific Railroad. It was purchased in 1983 by the Union Pacific and absorbed into their large system. This museum, obviously, is dedicated to the preservation of the Western Pacific Railroad and other railroads that the Union Pacific sucked up. So, of course, for $10, I decided to go in and check out all the artifacts that this museum carried. I don't know much about this museum, but I do believe that it was built 
on the former Western Pacific locomotive shops. Of course, along with the largest steam locomotives, Union Pacific also had the largest diesel locomotives, the 6900 series or the DD40AXs, which were built in the 1960s, actually 1969, and all were retired by the mid-1980s. As you can tell from this example here, they were well worn, well used, and I'm guessing a little bit neglected by the museum at the moment. I mean, they're doing Western Pacific, not really Union Pacific, as of yet, anyway. But this one looks like it's about ready to be repainted, rebuilt, and also ready for the road. Although, I don't know exactly how far it's going to go because they do run these trains, but they run them around a little loop around the uh, museum. Now, the other cool thing is they've got a lot of these old retired freight cars. And some of these boxcars I've never seen as far as designs go. So they were not only unique, but really, really cool looking. And when they do run the trains around the museum, they usually pull these strings of cabooses, which up until the early 90s were seen on the end of every freight train in America. So I decided to walk in on one of Southern Pacific's last built cabooses, built in the 1980s, just to see what it looked like. The Southern Pacific, of course, was purchased by the Union Pacific in 1993. And for the longest time, trying to absorb the Southern Pacific system into the Union Pacific system was a very tough pill to swallow. Now, as you can see here in the caboose, it looks like they really haven't done a lot of restoration work on it. Obviously, by the condition of the chairs and eh, some of the paint and graffiti and the fact that it was missing the stove. But it was still kind of cool to walk into a little piece of history of a railroad that I kind of grew up with when I was a kid. And it was also kind of nice to see some of the graffiti on there. So, this wouldn't be known as Cold War Ray without a Cold War car. And this was a World War II troop kitchen car that was converted to a caboose by the United States Air Force. As told by the Strategic Air Command symbol that, yeah, right there. And they got a whole bunch of troop cars in here and a whole bunch of cabooses that are in various stages of faded paint and faded paint. <clears throat> and it looks like it was picked up by all the railroads, of course, that the Union Pacific sucked up. And then, of course, there are the locomotives. And there was a lot of locomotives here from most of the major builders and many of the railroads up there in Northern California to include the Sierra Army Depot, which was sort of kind of nearby. But I mean, there were so many locomotives. And I have to wonder how the museum was able to acquire them all, especially some of the ones that look like they ran in the 1950s and 1960s. Assuming a lot of the switcher locomotives, like this little SW1 right here, were probably sold off as the railroads continued to modernize and the little switchers would go to grain elevators and little short line spinoffs that probably didn't last that long. But to see these units, especially these older ones like this Alco, which is the black one, and the Baldwin, which is the green one, it's like, where did they come from? Where did they set out their last few years of service? 
And then of course, out in the backfield, you've got more locomotives and freight cars that date all the way back to the 1920s. And I gotta sit here and go, how did they find them? It was really a fascinating visit. With the big boys, arrival still hours away i decided i was going to try and chase a couple of local freights but the only one i was able to chase was this one which came into portola outside the museum and stuck around there for a few hours on a crew change i finally found the spot where i wanted to photograph this massive steam locomotive coming into portola set up camp and decided to have a snack, listen to my scanner, and just wait. 4014 was still an hour away, so I decided to have a business lunch and some Gatorade and just wait. child inside of me, of course, jumped up and down with glee and joy, hearing the whistle and the sound of the 4014 big boy coming into Portola. And two days later, after its layover in Roseville, I decided I was going to at least head back to Truckee before I went to work on that Sunday and try and catch it again. Of course, what I didn't expect was that not only was I going to be the only one trying to catch it, but there were so many people that were trying to follow it, chase it, and just photograph it. It could have dwarfed out a Trump rally.
like I said, from Truckee to the western outskirts of Reno, every spot imaginable was filled up like a Trump rally, gone on steroids. But I was able to catch the 4014 going into the Sparks Yard layover for a couple of nights. After two days, I got up early in the morning so I could head out to Sparks again. And this time, I was determined to get some good pacing shots of the 4014 before I continued its tour eastward back to Wyoming. <clears throat> and so I stopped off at the Alamo truck stop. And again, I went to have breakfast, which was a little bit better than the one in Portola, but also pretty ridiculously expensive. Now, this time I went for a traditional breakfast of English muffins, scrambled eggs, hash browns, and some sausage that actually was sausage. This time the locations were a little bit better and the pacing was a little bit better but the only problem was there were so many active trains on this route versus the Western Pacific route that it was hard to keep down with the 4014 which was I guess a good thing because I was able to catch it in certain places. Like the siding here at Derby Dam, I was able to catch it, only to find out that it was going into the siding. It's about 45 minutes east of Reno and boasts a Walmart, a few truck stops, and a lot of farmland. This would also be the last place I would get a look at the 4014 rolling by and saying hello and goodbye to a childhood dream. And so there you have it, friends. Union Pacific's largest steam locomotive back in operation after about 40 years and 50 years almost to the day, I get to see it run again. From static display to operating locomotive, traveling down the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, there you have it. And as always, Dr. Pepria, Yablico, and I love goth girls because I couldn't find my Yablico shirt. Mm. My luck, I'm going to get hit by a hand car. Derusia, I almost forgot. Um, there's two links down here. Uh, one is to my Telegram channel, uh, the, the uh, Fallout Shelter. 
join. Let's talk when I can. Uh, the other thing is also on the bottom is a list of things that I would love to get on Amazon if, and I do say if, you can mail me stuff on Amazon. I don't know. Uh, and finally, at the bottom, if you don't have Amazon and you still want to mail me some cool stuff, uh, at the bottom is my P.O. Box, which means you can send me stuff. Send me stuff, but not a lot of stuff because I don't have a lot of room. I still have to look at the button.